Hello from the underground. God bless you all. Now in Isaac Asimov's The Naked Son, we left off right about where a lot of Jehoshaphats were getting dropped, just left and right. And this being a particularly juicy murder mystery, I reckon there's quite a few more Jehoshaphats in store. So, let us begin where we left off at chapter the seventh, A Doctor is Prodded. Daniel stood in the doorway. What happened, partner Elijah? But no explanation was needed. Daniel's voice changed to a loud ringing shout. Robots of Hannes Gruer, your master is hurt. Robots. At once a metal figure strode into the dining room, and after it, in a minute or two, a dozen more entered. Three carried Gruer away gently, the others busily engaged in straightening the disarray and picking up the tableware strewn on the floor. Daniel called out suddenly, You there, robots, never mind the crockery. Organize a search. Search the house for any human being. Alert the robots on the grounds outside. Have them go over every acre of the estate. If you find a master, hold him. Do not hurt him. Unnecessary advice. But do not let him leave, either. If you find a master present, let me know. I will remain at this viewer combination. Then, as robots scattered, Elijah muttered to Daniel, that's a beginning. It was poison, of course. Yes, that much is obvious, partner Elijah. Daniel sat down queerly, as though there was a sickness in his knees. Bailey had never seen him give way so. Not for an instant. Not to any action that resembled anything so human as a weakness in the knees, Daniel said. It is not well with my mechanism to see a human being come to harm. There was nothing you could do. That I understand, and yet it does, though there was a certain clogging in my thought paths, in human terms, what I feel might be the equivalent to shock. If that's so, get over it. Billy felt neither patience nor sympathy for a queasy robot. We've got to consider the little matter of responsibility. There is no poison without a poisoner. It might have been food poisoning. Accidental food poisoning. On a world this neatly run, never. Besides, the poison was in liquid, and the symptoms were sudden and complete. It was a poisoned dose, and a large one. Look, Daniil, I'll go into the next room and think this out a bit. You get Mrs. Delmar. Make sure she's at home and check the distance between her estate and Gruer's. Is it that you think she... Bailey held up a hand. Just find out, will you? He strode out of the room, seeking solitude. Surely... There could not be two independent attempts at murder so close together not to be uh, together at a time in a world like Solaria. And if a connection existed, the easiest assumption to make was that Gruer's story of conspiracy was true. Bailey felt a familiar excitement growing within him. He had come to this world with Earth's predicament in his mind and his own. The murder itself had been a far away thing, but now the chase was really on, the muscles in his jaw knotted. After all, the murderer or murderers or murderess had struck in his presence, and he was stung by that. Was he held in so little account? It was professional pride that was hurt, and Bailey knew it and welcomed the fact. At least it gave him a firm reason to see this thing through as a murder case, simply even without reference to Earth's danger. Daniel had located him now and was striding toward him. I have done, if you, done as you asked me to, partner Elijah. I have viewed Mrs. Delmar. She is at home, which is somewhat over a thousand miles from the estate of Agent Gruer. Bailey asked, I'll see her myself then, view her, I mean. He stared thoughtfully at Daniel. Do you think she has any connection with this crime? Apparently not a direct connection, partner Elijah. Does that imply there might be an indirect connection? She might have pursued, persuaded someone else to do it. Someone else? Bailey asked quickly. Who? That, partner Elijah, I cannot say. If someone were acting for her, that someone would have to be at the, the scene of the crime. Yes, said Daniel. 
someone must have been there to place the poison in the liquid. Isn't it possible that the poison liquid might have been prepared earlier in the day? Perhaps much earlier, Daniil said quietly. I had thought of that, partner Elijah, which is why I used the word apparently when I stated that Miss Damar had no direct connection with the crime. It is within the realm of possibility for her to have been on the scene earlier in the day. It would be well to check her movements. We will do that. We will check whether she was physically present at any time. Bailey's lips twitched. He had guessed that in some ways, robotic logic must fall short, and he was convinced of it now. As the roboticist had said, logic, but not reasonable. He said, let's go back into the viewing room and get Gruer's estate back in view. The room sparkled with freshness and order. There was no sign at all that less than an hour before, a man had collapsed in agony. Three robots stood, backs against the wall, in the usual robotic attitude of respectful submission. Bailey said, What news concerning your master? The metal robot said, The doctor is attending him, master. Viewing or seeing? Viewing, master. What does the doctor say? Will your master live? He is not yet certain, master. Bailey said, Has the house been searched? Thoroughly, master. Was there any sign of another master besides your own? No, master. Were there any signs of such presence in the near past? Not at all, master. Are the grounds being searched? Yes, master. Any results so far? No, master. Bailey nodded and said, I wish to speak to the robot that served at the table this night. It is being held for inspection, master. Its reactions are erratic. Can it speak? Yes, master. Then get it here without delay. There was delay, and Bailey began again. I said, Daniil interrupted smoothly, there is an interradio communication among these Solarian types. The robot you desire is being summoned. If it is moving slowly, it is part of the disturbance that has overtaken it as a result of what has occurred. Bailey nodded. He might have guessed at Interradio. In a world so thoroughly given over to robots, some sort of intimate communication among them would be necessary if the system was not to break down. It explained how a dozen robots could follow when one robot had been summoned, but only when needed and not otherwise. A robot entered. <clears throat> it limped, one leg dragging. Bailey wondered why and then shrugged. Even among the primitive robots on Earth, reactions to injury of the positronic paths were never obvious to the layman. A, disrup a disrupted circuit might strike a leg's functioning, as here, and the fact would be most significant to a roboticist and completely meaningless to anyone else, Bailey said cautiously. Do you remember a colorless liquid on your master's table, some of which you poured into the goblet for him? The robot said, Yes, master. A defect in oral articulation, too, Bailey said. What was the nature of the liquid? It was water, master. Just water, nothing else. Just water, master. Where did you get it? From the reservoir tap, master. Had <laughs> it been standing in the kitchen before you brought it in? The master preferred it not too cold, master. It was a standing order that it be poured an hour before meals. A convenient thought, Bailey, for anyone who knew that fact. He said, Have one of the robots, have one of the robots connect me with doctor viewing your master as soon as he is available. And while that is being done, I want another one to explain how the reservoir tap works. I want to know about the water supply here. The doctor was available with little delay. He was the oldest spacer Bailey had ever seen, which meant Bailey thought that he might be over 300 years old. The veins stood out on his hands, and his close-cropped hair was pure white. He had a habit of tapping his rigid front tooth with a fingernail, making a little clicking noise that Bailey found annoying. His name was Altim Thule. The doctor said, Fortunately, he threw up a good deal of the dose. Still, he may not survive. It is a tragic event. 
he sighed heavily. What was the poison, doctor? asked Bailey. I'm afraid I don't know. Click, 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 Bailey said. What? Then how are you treating him? Direct stimulation of the neuromuscular system to prevent paralysis, but except for that I am letting nature take its course. His face, with its faintly yellow skin like well-worn leather of superior quality, wore a pleading expression. We have very little experience with this sort of thing. I don't recall another case in over two centuries of practice. Bailey stared at the other with contempt. You know there are such things as poisons, don't you? Oh, yes. Click, click. Common knowledge. You have book film references where you can get... where you can gain some knowledge. It would take days. There are numerous mineral poisons. We make use of insecticides in our society, and it is not impossible to obtain bacterial toxins. Even with descriptions in the films, it would take a long time to gather the equipment and develop the techniques to test for them. If no one on Solaria knows, said Bailey grimly, I'd suggest you get in touch with one of the other worlds and find out. Meanwhile, you had better test the reservoir tap in Grua's mansion for poison. Get there in person if you have to, and do it. Bailey was prodding a venerable spacer roughly, ordering him about like a robot, and was quite unconscious of the incongruity of it. Nor did the spacer make any protests. Dr. Thule said doubtfully, How could the reservoir tap be poisoned? I'm sure it couldn't be. Probably not, agreed Bailey, but tested anyway to make sure. The reservoir tap was a dim possibility indeed. The robot's explanation had shown it to be a typical piece of Solarian self-care. Water might enter it from whatever source and be tailored to suit. Microorganisms were removed and non-living organic matter eliminated. The proper amount of aeration was introduced, as were various ions in just those trace amounts best suited to the body's needs. It was very unlikely that any poison could survive one or another of the control devices. Still, if the safety of the reservoir were directly established, then the time element would be clear. There would be the matter of the hour before the meal, when the pitcher of water, exposed to air, thought Bailey sourly, was allowed to warm slowly thanks to Gruer's idiosyncrasy, but Dr. Thule, frowning, was saying, But how would I test the reservoir tap? Josephat, take an animal with you. Inject some of the water you take out of the tap into its veins, or have it drink some. Use your head, man. And do the same for what's left in the pitcher, and if that's poisoned, as it must be. Run through some of the tests of the reference films described. Find some simple ones. Do something. Wait, wait, what's pitcher? The pitcher in which the water was standing. The pitcher from which the robot poured the poisoned drink. Well, dear me, I presume it has been cleaned up. The household retinue would surely not leave it standing about. Bailey groaned, of course not. It was impossible to return evidence with eager robots, or er, impossible to retain evidence with eager robots forever destroying it in the name of household duty. He should have ordered it preserved. But of course the society was not his own, and he had never reacted properly to it. Jehoshaphat. Word eventually came through that the Gruer estate was clear, no sign of any unauthorized human present anywhere. Daniel said, That rather intensifies the puzzle, partner Elijah. Now it seems to leave no one in the role of the poisoner. Bailey, absorbed in thought, scarcely heard. He said, What? Not at all. Not at all. It clarifies the matter. He did not explain, knowing quite well that Daniil would be incapable of understanding or believing what Daly, what Bailey was certain was the truth. Nor did Daniil ask for an explanation. Such an invasion of a human's thoughts would have been most unrobotic. Bailey prowled back and forth restlessly, 
during the approach of the sleep period, when his fears of the open would rise and his longing for earth increase, he felt an almost feverish desire to keep things happening. He said to Daniil, I might as well see Miss Delmar again. Have they robot make contact? They walked to the viewing room and Bailey watched a robot work with deft metal fingers. He watched through a haze of obscuring thought that vanished in startled astonishment when a stable, elaborately spread for dinner, suddenly f astonishment when a table, elaborately spread for dinner, suddenly filled half the room. Gladia's voice said, Hello. A moment later, she stepped into view and sat down. Don't be surprised, Elijah. It's just dinner time, and I'm very carefully dressed. See? She was. The dominant color of her dress was a light blue, and it shimmered down the length to her limbs, wrists, and ankles. A yellow ruff clung about her neck and shoulders, a little higher than her hair, which was now held in disciplined waves. Bailey said, I did not mean to interrupt her meal. I haven't begun yet. Why don't you join me? He eyed her suspiciously. Join you, she laughed. You Earthmen are so funny. I don't mean join me in personal presence. How could you do that? I mean, go to your own dining room, and then you and the other one can dine with me. But if I leave, your viewing technician can maintain contact. Daniil nodded gravely at that, and with some uncertainty, Bailey turned and walked towards the door. Gladia, together with her table, its setting and its ornaments moved with them. Gladia said encouragingly, See, your viewing technician is keeping us in contact. Bailey and Daniil traveled up a moving ramp that Bailey did not recall having transversed before. Apparently there were numerous possible routes between any two rooms in this impossible mansion, and he knew only a few of them. Daniil, of course, knew them all. And, moving through walls, sometimes a bit below floor level, sometimes a bit above, there was always Gladia at her dinner table. Bailey stopped and muttered, This takes getting used to. Gladia said at once, Does it make you dizzy? A little. Then, I'll tell you what, why don't you have your technician freeze me right here, then, when you're in your dining room and all set, he can join us up. Daniil said, I will order that done. Partner Elijah. They, <laughs> their own dinner table was set when they arrived, the plates steaming with a dark brown soup, in which diced meat was bobbing, and in the center a large roast fowl was ready for the carving. Daniil spoke briefly to the serving robot, and with smooth efficiency the two places that had been set were drawn to the same end of the table. As though that were a signal, the opposite wall seemed to move outward. The table seemed to lengthen, and Gladia was seated at the opposite end. Room joined to room, and table to table so neatly that but for a varying pattern in wall and floor covering, and the differing designs and tableware, it would have been easy to believe they were all dining together in actual fact. There, said Gladia with satisfaction. Isn't this comfortable? Quite, said Bailey. He tasted the soup gingerly, found it delicious, and helped himself more generously. You know about Agent Gruer. Trouble showered. Trouble shadowed her face at once, and she put her spoon down. Isn't it terrible? Poor Hannes. He'll use his first name. Do you know him? I know almost all the important people on Solaria. Most Solarians do know one another. Naturally. Naturally, indeed, thought Bailey. How many of them were there, after all? Bailey said, Then perhaps you know about Dr. Altham Thule. He's taking care of Gruer. Gladia laughed gently. Her serving robot sliced meat for her and added small brown potatoes and silvers of carrots. Of course I know him. He treated me. Treated you when? Right after the, the, the trouble. About my husband, I mean, Bailey said in astonishment. Is he the only doctor on the planet? Oh, no. For a moment, her lips moved as though she were counting to herself. There are at least ten. And there's one younger I know of who's studying medicine, but Dr. Thule is one of the best. 
He has the most experience. Poor Dr. Thu. Why, poor? Well, you know what I mean. It's such a nasty job, being a doctor. Sometimes you just have to see people when you're a doctor and even touch them. But Dr. Thu seems resigned to it. And he'll always do some seeing when he feels he must. He's, he's always treated me since I was a child, and he was always so friendly and kind, and I honestly feel I wouldn't mind almost if he did have to see me. For instance, he saw me this last time. After your husband's death, you mean? Yes. You can imagine how he felt when he saw my husband's dead body and me lying there. I was told he viewed the body, said Bailey. The body, yes. But after he made sure I was alive and in no real danger, he ordered the robots to put a, a pillow under my head and give me an injection of something or other and then get out. He came over by jet. Really? By jet. It took less than an hour. And he took care of me and made sure all was well. I was so woozy when I came to that I was sure I was only viewing him, you know. And it wasn't until he touched me that I knew we were seeing. And I screamed, poor Dr. Thule. He was awfully embarrassed, but I knew he meant well. Bailey nodded. I suppose there's not much use for doctors on this area. I should hope not. I know there are no germ diseases to speak of. What about metabolic disorders? Atherosclerosis? Diabetes? Things like that? It happens, and it's pretty awful when it does. Doctors can make life more livable for such people in a physical way, but that's the least of it. Oh. Of course. It means the gene analysis was imperfect. You don't suppose we allow defects like diabetes to develop on purpose? Anyone who develops such things has to undergo very detailed reanalysis. The mate assignment has to be retracted, which is terribly embarrassing for the mate. And it means no. No, no. Her voice sank to a whisper. Children. Bailey said in a normal voice. No children. Clydia flushed. It's a terrible thing to say, such a word. Ch children. It comes easily after a while, said Bailey, dryly. Yes, but if I get into the habit, I'll say it in front of another Salarian someday, and I'll just sink into the ground. Anyway, if the two of them have had children... Oh, see, I've said it again. Already, the children have to be found and examined. That was one of Rakane's jobs, by the way, and, well... It's just a mess. So much for Thu, thought Bailey. The doctor's incompetence was a normal, natural consequence of the society, and held nothing sinister. Nothing necessarily sinister. Cross him off, he thought, but lightly. He watched Gladia as she ate. She was neat and precisely delicate in her movements, and her appetite seemed normal. His own fowl was delightful, in one respect, anyway. Food, he could easily be spoiled by these outer worlds. He said, What is your opinion of the poisoning, Gladia? She looked up. I'm trying not to think of it. There are so many horrors lately. Maybe it wasn't poisoning. It was. But was anyone around? How do you know? There couldn't have been. He has no wife, these days, since he's all through with his quota of ch You know what. So there was no point. There was no one to put the poison in anything. So how could it be poisoned? But he was poisoned. That's a fact, and must be accepted. Her eyes clouded over. Do you suppose, she said, he did it himself? I doubt it. Why should he? And so publicly. Then it couldn't have been done, Elijah. It just couldn't. Bailey said. On the contrary, Gladia, it could have been done very easily. And I'm sure I know exactly how. E. Chapter the Eighth. A spacer is defiled. Oh, I cannot read today. A spacer is defied. Chapter 8, Part 2. 
Gladia seemed to be holding her breath for a moment. It came out through puckered lips in what was almost a whistle. She said, I'm sure I don't see how. Do you know who did it? Bailey nodded. The same one who killed your husband. Are you sure? Aren't you? Your husband's murder was the first in the history of Solaria. A month later, there is another murder? Could that be coincidence? Two separate murderers striking within a month of each other? On a crime-free world. Consider, too, that the second victim was investigating the first crime and therefore represented a violent danger to the original murderer. Well, Gladia applied herself to her dessert and said between mouthfuls, If you put it that way, I'm innocent. How so, Gladia? Well, Elijah, I've never been near the Gruer estate, never in my whole life, and I certainly couldn't have poisoned Agent Gruer, and if I haven't, why, neither did I kill my husband. Then, as Bailey maintained a stern silence, her spirit seemed to fade into the corners of her small mouth as they drooped. Don't you think so, Elijah? I can't be sure, said Bailey. I've told you I know the method used to poison Gruer. It's an ingenious one, and anyone, anyone on Solaria could have used it. Whether they were on the Gruer estate or not, whether they were ever on the Gr whether they were ever on the Gruer estate or not, Lydia clenched her hands into fists. Are you saying I did it? I'm not saying that. You are implying it. Her lips were thin with fury, and her high cheekbones were splotchy. Is that all your interest in viewing me? To ask me sly questions? To trap me? Now wait! You seemed so sympathetic, so understanding, you, you Earthman. Her contralto had, been, had become a tortured rasp with the last word. Daniel's perfect face leaned toward Clodia, and he said, If you will pardon me, Mrs. Delmar, you are holding a knife rather tightly and may cut yourself. Please be careful. Lydia stared wildly at the short, blunt, undoubtedly quite harmless knife she held in her hand. With a spasmodic movement, she raised it high. Bailey said, You couldn't reach me, Gladia. She gasped. Who'd want to reach you? Ugh. She shuddered in exaggerated disgust and called out, Break contact at once. The last must have been to a robot out of the line of sight. And Gladia and her own end of the room were gone and the original wall sprang back. Daniil said, Am I correct in believing you now consider this woman guilty? No, said Paley flatly. Whoever did this needed a great deal more of a certain characteristics than this poor girl has. She has a temper. What of that? Most people do. Remember, too, that she has been under a considerable strain for a considerable time. If I had been under a similar strain and someone had turned on me as she imagined I had turned on her, I might have done a great deal more than wave a foolish little knife, Daniel said. I have not been able to deduce the technique of poisoning at a distance, as you say you have. Bailey found it pleasant to be able to say, I know you haven't. You lack the capacity to decipher this particular puzzle. He said it with finality, and Daniil accepted the statement as calmly and as gravely as ever. Bailey said, I have two jobs for you, Daniil. And what are they, partner Elijah? First, get in touch with this Dr. Thule and find out Mrs. Delmar's condition at the time of the murder of her husband, how long she required treatment, and so on. Do you want to determine something in particular? No, I'm just trying to accumulate data. It isn't easy on this world. Secondly, find out who will be taking Gruber's place as head of security and arrange a viewing session with me first thing in the morning. As for me, 
he said without pleasure in his mind, and with none in his voice, I'm going to bed, and eventually, I hope I'll sleep. Then, almost petulantly, Do you suppose I could get a decent book film in this place? Daniel said. I would summon that you I would suggest that you summon the robot in charge of the library. Bailey felt only irritation at having to deal with the robot. He would much rather have browsed at will. No, he said, not a classic. Just an ordinary piece on fiction dealing with everyday life on a contemporary solaria. About half a dozen of them. The robot submitted. It would have to. But even as it manipulated the proper controls that plucked the requisite book films out of their niches and transferred them first to an exit slot and then to Bailey's hand, it rattled on in respectful tones about all the other categories in the library. He might like an adventure romance of the days of exploration, it suggested, or an excellent view on chemistry, perhaps with animated atom models, or a fantasy, or a galactic galactography. The list was endless. Bailey waited grimly for his half dozen, said, these will do. Reached with his own hands, his own hands, for a scanner and walked away. When the robot followed and said, will you require help with the adjustment, master? Bailey turned and snapped, no, stay where you are. The robot bowed and stayed. Lying in bed with the headboard aglow, Bailey almost regretted his decision. The scanner was like no model he had ever used, and he began with no idea at all as to how, as to the method for threading the film. But he worked at it obstinately, and eventually, by taking it apart and working it out bit by bit, he managed something. At least he could view the film, and the focus left a bit to be desired. It was a small payment for a moment's independence for the robots. In the next hour and a half, he had skipped and switched through four of the six films and was disappointed. He had had a theory. There was no better way, he had thought, to get an insight into Solarian ways of life and thought than to read the novels. He needed that insight if he were to conduct the investigation sensibly. But now he had to abandon this theory. He had viewed novels and had succeeded only learning of people with ridiculous problems who behaved foolishly and reacted mysteriously. Why should a woman abandon her job on discovering her child had entered the same profession and refused to explain her reasons until unbearable and ridiculous complications had resulted? Why should a doctor and an artist be humiliated at being assigned to one another, and what is so noble about the doctor's insistence on entering robotic research? He threaded the fifth novel into the scanner and adjusted it to his eyes. He was bone-weary. So weary, in fact, that he never afterward recalled anything of the fifth novel, which he believed to be a suspense story except for the opening in which a new estate owner entered his mansion and looked through the past account films presented him by a respectful robot. Presumably, he fell asleep then with a scanner on in his head, scanner on his head, and all lights blazing. Presumably, a robot, entering respectfully, had gently removed the scanner and put out the lights. In any case, he slept and dreamt of Jesse. All was as it had been. He had never left Earth. They were ready to travel to the community kitchen and then to see a sub-etheric show with friends. They would travel over the expressways and see people and neither of them had a care in the world. He was happy and Jesse was beautiful. He had lost weight some- she had lost weight somehow. Why should she be so slim and so beautiful? And one other thing was wrong. Somehow, the sun shone down on them. He looked up, and there was only the vaulted base of the upper levels visible. Yet the sun shone down, blazing brightly on anything, everything, and no one was afraid. Bailey woke up disturbed. 
He let the robots serve breakfast and did not speak to Daniil. He said nothing, asked nothing, downed excellent coffee without tasting it. Why had he dreamed of the visible, invisible sun? He could understand dreaming of Earth and of Jesse, but what had the sun to do with it? And why should a thought of it bother him anyway? Partner Elijah, said Daniil gently. What? Corwin Attlebush will be in the viewing contact with you in half an hour. I have arranged it. Who the hell is Corwin Whatchamacallum? asked Bailey sharply and refilled his coffee cup. He was Agent Grower's chief aside, partner Elijah, and is now acting head of secretary. Security. Then get him now. The appointment, as I explained, is for half an hour from now. I don't care when it's for. Get him now. That's an order. I will make the attempt, partner Elijah. He may not, however, agree to receive the call. Let's take the chance and get on with it, Daniil. The acting head of security accepted the call, and for the first time on Solaria, Bailey saw a spacer who looked like the usual earthly conception of one. Atlebish was a tall, lean, and bronze one. His eyes were a light brown, his chin large and hard. He looked faintly like Daniil, but whereas Daniil was idealized, almost godlike, Corwin Atlebish had lines of humanity in his face. Atlebish was shaving. A small, abrasive pencil gave out its spray of fine particles that swept over cheek and chin, biting off the hair neatly and then disintegrating into impalpable dust. Bailey recognized the instrument through hearsay, but had never seen one used before. You're the Earthman, asked Atlebish slurringly through barely cracked lips. As the abrasive dust passed under his nose, Bailey said, I'm Elijah Bailey, plainclothesman C7. I'm from Earth. You're early. Atlebish snapped his shaver shut and tossed it somewhere outside Bailey's range of vision. What's on your mind, Earthman? Bailey would not have overjoyed the other's tone of voice at the best of times. He burned now, he said. How is Agent Gruer? Edelbush said, he's still alive. He may still, he may stay alive. Bailey nodded. Your poisoners here on Solaria don't know dosages. Lack of experience. They gave Gruer too much and he threw it up. Half the dose would have killed him. Poisoners. There's no evidence for poison. Bailey stared. Jehoshaphat. What else do you think it is? A number of things. Much can go wrong with a person. He rubbed his face, looking for roughness with his fingertips. You would scarcely know the metabolic problems that arise past the age of 250. If that's the case, have you obtained competent medical advice? Dr. Thule's report, that did it. The anger that had been boiling inside Bailey since waking burst through. He cried at the top of his voice. I don't care about Dr. Thule. I said competent medical advice. Your doctors don't know anything, and more than your detectives would if you had any. You had to get a detective from Earth. Get a doctor as well. The Solarian looked at him coldly. Are you telling me what to do? Yes, and without charge. Be my guest. Gruer was poisoned. I witnessed the process. He drank, retched, and yelled as his throat was burning. What do you call it when you consider that he was investigating? Bailey came to a sudden halt. Investigating what? Atlebish was unmoved. Bailey was uncomfortably aware of Daniil at his usual position some ten feet away. Gruer had not wanted Daniil as an aurora to know of the investigation said lamely. There were political implications. Adelbish crossed his arms and looked distant, bored, and faintly hostile. We have no politics on Solaria in the sense we hear of in other worlds. Hannes Gruer had been a good citizen, but he is imaginative. 
It was he who, having heard some story about you, urged that we import you. He never agreed to accept an Aurora and companion for you as a condition. I did not think it necessary. There is no mystery. Rick Kane Delmar was killed by his wife, and we shall find out how and why, even if we do not. She will be genetically analyzed and the proper measures taken. As for Gruer, your fantasy concerning poisoning is of no importance. Bailey said incredulously, You seem to imply that I'm not needed here. I believe not. If you wish to return to Earth, you may do so. I may even say we urge you to. Bailey was amazed at his own reaction. He cried, No, sir, I won't budge. We hired you, plain clothesman. We can discharge you. You will return to your home planet. No, you listen to me. I'll advise you to. You're a big time spacer and I'm an Earthman, but with all respect, with deepest and most humble apologies, you're scared. Withdraw that statement. Edelbish drew himself to his six foot plus and stared down at the Earthman haughtily. You're scared as hell. You think you'll be next if you pursue the thing. You're giving an in, so they'll let you alone. So they'll leave you your miserable life. Billy had no notion who the they might be, if there were any they at all. He was striking out blindly at an arrogant spacer and enjoying the thud his phrases made as they hit against the other's self-control. You will leave, said Atelbish, putting his finger in cold, pointing his finger in cold anger within the hour. There will be do no diplomatic considerations about this, I assure you. Save your threats, Spacer. Earth is nothing to you, I'll admit. But I'm not the only one here. May I introduce my partner, Daniil Alava. He's from Aurora. He doesn't talk much. He's not here to talk. I handle that department. Well, he listens awfully well. He doesn't miss a word. Let me put it straight, Atelbish. Bailey used the unadorned name with relish. Whatever monkey shines are going on here in Solaria, Aurora and 40-odd other outer worlds are interested. If you kick us off, the next deputation to visit Solaria will consist of warships. I'm from Earth, and I know how the system works. Hurt feelings mean warships by return trip. Edelbish transferred his regard to Daniil and seemed to be considering. His voice was gentler. There is nothing going on here that need concern anyone outside the planet. Gruer thought otherwise, and my partner heard him. This was no time to cavil at a lie. Daniil turned to look at Bailey. At the Earthman's last statement, Bailey paid no attention. He drove on. I intend to pursue this investigation. Ordinarily, there's nothing I wouldn't do to get back to Earth. Even just dreaming about me gets me so restless I can't sit. If I owned this robot-infested palace I'm living in now, I'd give it with the robots thrown in, and you and all your lousy world to boot for a ticket home. But I wouldn't be ordered off by you. Not while there's a case in which I've been assigned that's still open. Try getting rid of me against my will and you'll be looking down the throats of space-based artillery. What's more, from now on, this murder investigation is going to be run my way. I'm in charge. I see the people I want to see. I see them. I don't view them. I'm used to seeing, and that's the way it's going to be. I want the official approval of your office for all of that. That's impossible. Unbearable. Daniil, you tell him. The humanoid's voice said dispassionately, As my partner has informed you, Agent Edelbish, we have been sent here to conduct a murder investigation. It is essential that we do so. We, of course, do not wish to disturb any of your customs, and perhaps actual seeing will be unnecessary, although it would be helpful if you were to give approval for such seeing as becomes necessary as plain clothesman Bailey has requested. As to leaving the planet against our will, we feel that it would be inadvisable. 
although we regret any feelings on your part or on the part of any Solarian that our remaining would be unpleasant. Bailey listened to this tilted sentence structure with a dour stretching of his lips that was not a smile. To one who knew Daniil as a robot, it was all an attempt to do a job without giving offense to any human. Not to Bailey and not to Etelbish. To one who thought Daniil was an Auroran, a native of the oldest and most powerful military of the Outer Worlds, it seemed like a series of subtly courteous threats. Atelbesh put the tip of his fingers to his forehead. I'll think about it. Not too long, said Bailey, because I have some visiting to do within the hour and not by viewer. Done viewing! He signaled the robots to break contact. Then he stared with surprise and pleasure at the place where Atelbesh had been. None of this had been planned. It had all been impulse, born of his dream and of Atelbish's unnecessary arrogance. But now, if it had happened, he was glad. It was what he had wanted, really, to take control, he thought, anyways, that was telling the dirty spacer. He wished the entire population of Earth could have been here to watch. The man looked such a spacer, and that made it all the better. Of course. All the better. Only... Why his feeling of vehemence in the matter of seeing? Bailey scarcely understood that. He knew what he planned to do, and seeing, not viewing, was part of it. All right. Yet there had been the tight lift to his spirit when he spoke of seeing, as though he were ready to break down the walls of this mansion, even though it served no purpose. Why? There was something impelling him besides the case, something that had been something that had nothing to do even with the questions of Earth's safety. But what? Oddly, he remembered his dream again, the sun shining down through the opaque layers of the gigantic underground cities of Earth. Daniil said with thoughtfulness, as far as his voice would carry a recognizable emotion, I wonder, partner Elijah, if this is entirely safe. Bluffing this character? It worked. And it wasn't really a bluff. I think it is important to Aurora to find out what's going on in Solaria, and that Aurora knows it. Thank you, by the way, for not catching me out in a misstatement. It was the natural decision. To have borne you out at Agent Atelbish a certain rather subtle harm. To have given you the lie would have done you a greater and more direct harm. Potentials countered in the higher one worn out, eh, Daniil? So it was, partner Elijah. I understand that this process, in a less definable way, goes on within the human mind. I repeat, however, that this new proposal of yours is not safe. Which new proposal is this? I do not approve of your notion of seeing people. By that, I mean seeing as opposed to viewing. I understand you. I'm not asking for your approval. I have my instructions, partner Elijah. What it was that Agent Hannes Gruber told you during my absence last night, I cannot know. That he did say something is obvious from the change in your attitude towards this problem. However, in the light of my instructions, I can guess. He must have warned you of a possibility of danger to other planets arising from the situation on Solaria. Slowly. Bailey reached for his pipe. He did that occasionally, and always there was a feeling of irritation when he found nothing and remembered he could not smoke. He said, There are only 20,000 Solarians. What danger can they present? My masters on Aurora have for some time been uneasy about Solaria. I have not been told all the information at their disposal. And what little did... What little have you been told, and have been told not to repeat to me? Is that it? Demanded Bailey. Daniel said, There is a great deal to find out before this matter can be discussed freely. Well, what are the Solarians doing? New weapons? Paid subversion? A campaign of individual assassinations? What can 20,000 people do against hundreds of millions of spacers? Daniel remained silent. 
Bailey said. I intend to find out, you know. But not the way you have now proposed, partner Elijah. I have been instructed most carefully to guard your safety. You would have to anyway, first law. Over and above that as well. In conflict between your safety and that of another, I must guard yours. Of course, I understand that. If anything happens to me, there is no further way in which you can remain on Solaria without complications that Aurora is not yet ready to face. As long as I'm alive, I'm here on Solaria's original request, and so we can throw our weight around, if necessary, and make them keep us. If I'm dead, the whole situation has changed. Your orders are, then, to keep Bailey arrive, alive. Am I right, Daniel? Daniel said, I cannot presume to interpret the reasons behind my orders. Bailey said, all right, don't worry. The open space won't kill me. If I do find it necessary to see anyone, I'll survive. I may even get used to it. It is not a matter of open space alone, partner Elijah, said Daniel. It is this matter of seeing Salarians. I do not approve of it. You mean the spacers won't like it? Too bad if they don't. Let them wear those filters and gloves. Let them spray the air. And if it offends their nice morals to see me in the flesh, let them wince and blush. But I intend to see them. I consider it necessary to do so, and I will do so. But I cannot allow you to. You can't allow me. Surely you see why not, partner Elijah. I do not. Consider, then, that Agent Gruer, the key Solarian figure in the investigation of this murder, has been poisoned. Does it not follow that if I permit you to proceed in your plan for exposing yourself indiscriminately in actual person, the next victim will necessarily be you yourself? How then can I possibly permit you to leave the safety of this mansion? How will you stop me, Daniil? By force if necessary, partner Elijah, said Daniil calmly, even if I must hurt you. If I do not do so, you will surely die. Chapter the Ninth. A robot is stymied. <laughs> uh, cheers. Told you this is juicy, and muchos Jehoshaphats are plenty. Mm. It is licorice tea this time. We didn't mistake that. Aye, chapter the ninth. Bailey said, So the higher potential wins out again, Daniel. You will hurt me to keep me alive. I do not believe hurting you will be necessary, partner Elijah. You know that I am superior to you in strength, and you will not attempt a useless resistance. If it should become necessary, however, I will be compelled to hurt you. I could blast you down where you stand, said Bailey. Right now, there is nothing in my potentials to prevent me. I had thought you might take this attitude at some time in our present relationship, partner Elijah. Most particularly, a thought occurred to me during our trip to the mansion, when you grew momentarily violent in the ground car. The destruction of myself is unimportant in comparison with your safety, but such destruction would cause you distrust eventually and disturb the plans of my masters. It was one of my first cares, therefore, during your first sleeping period, to deprive your blaster of its charge. Bailey's lips tightened. He was left without a charged blaster. His hand dropped instantly to the holster. He drew his weapon and stared at the charge reading. It hugged zero. For a moment, he balanced a lump of useless metal as though to hurl it directly at Daniil's face. What could? The robot would dodge efficiently. Bailey put the blaster back. It could not be recharged in good time. Slowly, thoughtfully, he said, I'm not fooled by you, Daniil. In what way, partner Elijah? You are too much the master. I am too completely stopped by you. Are you a robot? You have doubted me before, said Daniil. On Earth last year, I doubted whether our Daniil Oliver was truly a robot. It turned out he was. I believe he still is. 
My question, whoever is this? However is this? Are you, are, Daniil Oliva? I am, yes. Daniil was designed to imitate a spacer closely. Why could not a spacer be made up to imitate Daniil closely? For what reason? To carry on an investigation here with greater initiative and capacity than ever a robot could. And yet by assuming Daniil's role, you could keep me safely under control by giving me a false consciousness of mastery. After all, you are working through me and I must be kept pliable. All this is not so, partner Elijah. Why then do all the Salarians we meet assume you to be human? They are robotic experts. Are they so easily fooled? It occurs to me that I cannot be one right against many wrong. It is far more likely that I am one wrong against many right. Not at all, partner Elijah. Prove it, said Bailey, moving slowly toward an end table and lifting a scrap disposal unit. You can do that easily enough if you are a robot. Show me the metal beneath your skin, Daniil said. I assure you, show the metal, said Bailey crisply. That's an order. Oh, don't you feel compelled to obey orders? Daniil unbuttoned his shirt. The smooth, bronze skin of his chest was sparsely covered with light hair. Daniil's fingers exerted a firm pressure just beneath the right nipple, and flesh and skin split bloodlessly the length of the chest with a gleam of metal shelling beneath. And as that happened, Bailey's fingers resting on the end table moved half an inch to the right and stabbed at the contact patch. Almost at once, the robot entered. Don't move, Daniil, cried Bailey. That's an order. Freeze. Daniil stood motionless as though life or the robotic imitation thereof had departed from him. Bailey shouted to the robot, can you get two more of the staff in here without yourself leaving? If so, do it, the robot said. Yes, master. Two more robots entered, answering a radioed call. The three lined up abreast. Boys, said Bailey, do you see this creature whom you thought a master? Six ruddy eyes had turned solemnly on Daniel. They said in unison, we see him, master. Bailey said, do you also see the so-called master is actually a robot like yourself, since it is metal within? It is only designed to look a man. Yes, master. You are not required to obey any orders it gives you. Do you understand that? Yes, master. I, on the other hand, said Bailey, am a true man. For a minute, the robots hesitated. Bailey wondered if... Having had it shown to them that a, sing that a thing might seem man yet be a robot, they would accept anything in human appearance as a man, anything at all. But then, one robot said, You are a man, master. And Bailey drew breath again. He said, Very well, Daniil, you may relax. Daniil moved into a more natural position and said calmly, your expressed doubt as to my identity, then, was merely a feint designed to exhibit my nature to these others, I take it. So it was, said Bailey, and looked away. He thought, the thing is a machine, not a man. You can't double-cross a machine. And yet, he couldn't entirely repress a feeling of shame. Even as Daniil stood there, chest open, there seemed something so human about him, something capable of being betrayed. Bailey said, Close your chest, Daniil, and listen to me. Physically, you are no match for three robots. You see that, don't you? That is clear, partner Elijah. Good. Now you boys. He turned to the other robots again. You are to tell no one, human or master, that this creature is a robot. Never at any time, without further instructions from myself and myself alone. I thank you, interposed Daniil softly. However, Bailey went on, this manlike robot is not to be allowed to interfere with my actions in any way. If it attempts any such interference, you will restrain it by force, taking care not to damage it unless absolutely necessary. Do not allow it to establish contact with humans other than myself, 
or with robots other than yourselves, either by seeing or by viewing. And do not leave it at any time. Keep it in this room and remain here yourselves. Your other duties are susp suspended until further notice. Is all this clear? Yes, master, they chorused. Bailey turned to Daniil again. There's nothing you can do now, so don't try to stop me. Bailey turned to Daniil again. Ah, oh, <laughs> oh, I mean, that was a good line. Sorry, shit, the immersion. Daniil's arms hung loosely at his side. He said, I may not, through inaction, allow you to come to harm, partner Elijah. Yet under the circumstances, nothing but inaction is, is possible. The logic is unassailable. I shall do nothing. I trust you will remain safe and in good health. There it was, thought Bailey. Logic was logic, and Roberts had nothing else. Logic told Daniil he was completely stymied. Reason might have told him that all factors are rarely predictable, but the opposition might make a mistake. None of that. A robot is logical only, not reasonable. Again. Bailey felt a twinge of shame, and could not forbear an attempt at consolation. He said, Look, Daniil, even if I were walking into danger, which I'm not, he added that hurriedly, with a quick glance at the other robots, it would only be my job. It is what I'm paid to do. It is as much my job to prevent harm to mankind as a whole, as yours is to prevent harm to man as an individual. Do you see? I do not, partner Elijah. Then that is because you're not made to see. Take my word for it that if you were a man, you would see. Daniel bowed his head in acquiescence and remained standing motionless while Bailey walked slowly toward the door of the room. The three robots parted to make room for him and kept their photoelectric eyes fixed firmly on Daniil. Bailey was walking to a kind of freedom, and his heart beat rapidly in anticipation of the fact, then skipped a beat. Another robot was approaching the door from the other side. There's something going wrong? What is it, boy? He snapped. A message has been forwarded to you, Master, from the Office of Acting Head of Security, Atelbish. Bailey took the personal capsule handed to him, and it opened at once. A finely inscribed strip of paper unrolled. He wasn't startled. Solaria would have his fingerprints on file, and the capsule would be adjusted to open at the touch of his particular convolutions. He read the message, and his long face mirrored satisfaction. It was his official permission to arrange seeing interviews, subject to the wishes of the interviewees, who were nevertheless urged to give Agent Bailey and Olava every possible cooperation. Atelbish had capitulated, even to the extent of putting an Earthman's name first. It was an excellent omen with which to begin, finally, an investigation conducted as it should be conducted. Bailey was in the airborne vessel again, as he had been on that trip from New York to Washington. This time, however, there was a difference. The vessel was not closed in. The windows were left transparent. It was clear. It was a clear, bright day, and from where Bailey sat, the windows were so many patches of blue. Unrelieved, featureless. He tried not to huddle. He buried his head in his knees only when he could absolutely no longer help it. The ordeal of his was of his own choosing. His state of triumph, his unusual sense of freedom at having beaten down first Etelbish and then Daniel, his feeling of having asserted the dignity of Earth against the spacers almost demanded it. He had begun by stepping across open ground to the waiting plane with a kind of light-headed dizziness that was almost enjoyable, and he had ordered the windows left unblanked in a kind of manic self-confidence. I have to get used to it, he thought, 
and stared at the blue until his heart beat rapidly and the lump in his throat swelled beyond endurance. He had to close his eyes and bury his head, bury his head under the protective cover of his arms at shortening intervals. Slowly, his confidence trickled away, and even a touch of his holster of his fingers' freshly recharged blaster could not reverse the flow. E Slowly, his confidence trickled away, and even the touch of the holster of his freshly recharged blaster could not reverse the flow. He tried to keep his mind on the plan of attack. First, learn the ways of the planet. Sketch in the background against which everything must be placed or fail to make sense. See a sociologist. He had asked a robot for the name of the Salarian most eminent as a sociologist, and there was that comfort about robots. They asked no questions. The robot gave the name and vital statistics and paused to remark that the sociologist would probably be at lunch and would, therefore, possibly ask to delay contact. Lunch? said Bailey sharply. Don't be ridiculous. It's not noon by two hours. The robot said, I'm using local time, master. Bailey stared, then understood. On Earth, with its hurried cities, day and night, waking and sleeping, were man-made periods, adjusted to suit the needs of the community and the planet. On a planet such as this, exposed nakedly to the sun, day and night were not a matter of choice at all, but were imposed on man, willy-nilly. Bailey tried to picture a world as a sphere, being lit and unlit as it turned. He found it hard to do, and felt scornful of the so superior spacers who let such an essential thing as time be dictated to them by the vagaries of planetary movement. He said, contact him anyway. Robots were there to meet the plane when it landed, and Bailey, stepping out into the open again, found himself trembling badly. He muttered to the nearest of the robots, let me hold your arm, boy. The sociologist waited for him, down the length of a hall, smiling tightly. Good afternoon, Mr. Bailey. Bailey nodded breathlessly. Good evening, sir. Would you blank out the windows? The sociologist said, They are blanked out already. I know something of the ways of Earth. Will you follow me? Bailey managed it without robotic help, following at a considerable distance across and through a maze of hallways. When he finally sat down in a large and elaborate room, he was glad of the opportunity to rest. The walls of the room were set in curved, shallow alcoves. Statuary in pink and gold accompanied every niche. Abstract figures that pleased the eye without yielding instant meaning. A large box-like affair with white and dangling cylindrical objects, and numerous pedals suggesting a musical instrument. Bailey looked at the sociologist standing before him. The spacer looked precisely as, it, as he had when Bailey had viewed him earlier that day. He was tall and thin, and his hair was pure white. His face was strikingly wedge-shaped, his nose prominent, his eyes deep-set and alive. His name was Anselmo Kemo. They stared at one another until Bailey felt he could trust his voice to be reasonably normal. Then his first remark had nothing to do with the investigation. In fact, it, has, it was nothing he had planned. He said, May I have a drink? A drink. The sociologist's voice was a trifle too high-pitched to be entirely pleasant. He said, You wish water? I prefer something alcoholic. The sociologist's look grew sharply uneasy, as though the obligation of hospitality were something in which he was unacquainted. And that, thought Bailey, was literally so. In a world where viewing was the thing, there would be no sharing of food and drink. A robot brought him a small cup of smooth enamel. The drink was a light pink thing. Billy sniffed at it cautiously and tasted it even more cautiously. 
The small sip of liquid evaporated warmly in his mouth and sent a pleasant message along the length of his esophagus. His next sip was more substantial. Quemo said, If you wish more... No, thank you, not now. It is good of you, sir, to agree to see me. Quemo tried a smile and failed rather markedly. It has been a long time since I've done anything like this. Yes. He almost squirmed as he spoke. Billy said, I imagine you find this rather hard. Quite. Quimo turned away sharply and retreated to a cha chair at the opposite end of the room. He angled the chair so that it faced more away from Bailey than toward him and sat down. He clasped the gloved hands and his nostrils seemed to quiver. Bailey finished his drink and felt warmth in his limbs and even the return of something of his confidence. He said, Exactly how does it feel to have me here, Dr. Cuemo? The, so the sociologist muttered, That is an uncommonly personal question. I know it is, but I think I explained when I viewed you earlier what I was engaged in a murder investigation and that I would have to ask a great many questions, some of which were bound to be personal. I'll help if I can, said Quimmel. I hope the questions will be decent ones. He kept looking away as he spoke. His eyes, when they struck Bailey's face, did not linger, but slipped away. Bailey said, I don't ask about your feelings out of curiosity only. This is essential to the investigation. I don't see how. I've got to know as much as I can about this world. I must understand how Solarians feel about ordinary matters. Do you see that? Quimo did not look at Bailey at all now. He said slowly, Ten years ago, my wife died. Seeing her was never very easy, of course. It is something one learns to bear in time. And she was not the intrusive sort. I have been assigned no new wife since I am past the age of... of... He looked at Bailey as though requesting him to supply the phrase. And when Bailey did not do so, he continued in a lower voice. Suring. Without even a wife, I have grown quite unusual to this phenomenon. Uh, I have grown quite unused to this phenomenon of seeing. But how does it feel? insisted Bailey. Are you in panic? He thought of himself on the plane. No, not in panic. Quimo angled his head to catch a glimpse of Bailey and then almost instantly withdrew. But I will be frank, Mr. Bailey. I imagine I can smell you. Bailey automatically leaned back in his chair, painfully self-conscious. Smell me. Quite imaginary, of course, said Quimo. I cannot say whether you do have an odor or how strong it is, but even if you had a strong one, my nose filters would keep it from me, y yet imagination, he shrugged. I understand. It's worse. You'll forgive me, Mr. Bailey, but in the actual presence of a human, I feel as strongly as though something slimy were about to touch me. I keep shrinking away. It is most unpleasant. Bailey rubbed his ear thoughtfully and fought to keep down annoyance. After all, it was the other's neurotic reactions to a simple state of affairs. He said, If all this is so, I'm surprised you agreed to see me so readily. Surely you anticipated this unpleasantness? I did. But you know, I was curious. You're an Earthman. Bailey thought sardonically that that should have been another argument against seeing. 
but he said only, What does that matter? A kind of jerky enthusiasm entered Quemo's voice. It's not something I can explain easily. Not even to myself, really. But I've worked on sociology for ten years now, really worked. I've developed propositions that are quite new and startling, and yet basically true. It is one of these propositions that makes me most extraordinarily interested in Earth and Earthmen. You see, if you were to consider Solaria's society and way of life carefully, it will become obvious to you that the said society and way of life is modeled directly and closely on that of Earth itself. Thus ends chapter 10. And... Uh, our time together in the underground. Thank you for viewing. Uh... Oh, wowee, it's 11-11. Hmm, okay, well, love you. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.